I woke up this morning and it was all foggy and crisp and cool and you know that we're in between the seasons right now and we're also in between sermon series here at the Donaldson Fellowship. So it's a good Sunday for me just to share something that has really been on my mind my entire adult life. And that is, how do we make disciples? How do we mentor? What does it mean to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus? When I began pastoring uh, in 1977 in a little church outside of Greenville, Tennessee, I remember one day walking behind my house, and there was a pasture and some fields there and a little creek that ran through it, and there was a rock that I sat down on, and I recall praying. I was just beginning my work, and I said, Lord, somewhere in this little community out in the country, there must be a young man who wants to be discipled. Give me the opportunity of discipling him, of mentoring him. And that's a particular burden and desire that has never left me, and I don't think it should leave any of us because, well, one of the purposes of our church and our vision statement is that we are to be a congregation that intentionally makes disciple makers. So we want to be disciples. We want to disciple others, and we want to be part of this mentoring process in the lives of whoever the Lord brings across our paths. And so I want to deal with that today. And the opening text that I want to show you is what I'm calling the Great Commission of Disciple-Making. And it's in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2. So I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. If you're watching online, then just grab a Bible if you can, if you're where you're able to do that, and follow along with this. We'll look at some other passages as well. But 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. So here we have a chain, a chain reaction. We have multiple generations. And the Apostle Paul was saying to Timothy, and who was Timothy? At this point, we believe that Timothy was the pastor or the overseer of the churches in the city of Ephesus. In fact, 1 Timothy is addressed that way. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, the reason that I left you behind in Ephesus is that you can and he gives him his instructions. So Timothy here is the pastor of these congregations in the great city of Ephesus. And Paul says to him, now there is a chain reaction of disciple making that should be taking place in this church in Ephesus. So the things that you have heard me say to you, you tell other people. And you equip those other people to tell others as well. So we have here the first four generations and a chain of disciple-making that is extended for 2,000 years and comes down even to our own day. I mean, you and I are at the tail end right now of this chain reaction, and hopefully we're not going to be the end of it because we're going to be doing this as well and telling other people the things we have learned and equipping them to tell others too. So how do we learn how to do this? If we are to be disciples then how do we become disciples who make disciples? And I would like to use the church in Ephesus as a laboratory. I think that what happened in this great city of Ephesus, it's the greatest of the New Testament churches, the deepest, the uh, most zealous of all of the churches, the most uh, uh, doctrinally pure and, and uh, well-educated of all of the New Testament churches. And we can learn a lot from the church of Ephesus about the four different stages of being and making disciples. So that's the paradigm we're looking at. And so we have to begin with the book of Acts in chapter number 19 and how the church began. So let's just say 
you're going to try this at home. You're going to do this with your children or at church with the people in your life group or maybe the children or young people or college-age students that you're teaching or maybe somebody that crosses your path at work, and they just need some spiritual help getting to the next stage in their life, and God places you there, and you're able to provide some mentoring. You're able to disciple somebody else. How do you go about it? Well, there are four stages, and the first stage has to do with the heart. So look at chapter 19 of the book of Acts and verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. This is that great city on the Aegean Sea that serves as the gateway for all of Asia. And he found some, look at this word, disciples. He was looking for disciples. He was wanting to make disciples. There were some. But as he talked to these disciples, he realized something was missing. There was no evidence of the Holy Spirit in their life. In fact, there was no evidence of Christ in their life. And so he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. So we have to understand that at this point, the ministry of John the Baptist, when he began, that was phenomenal. It was like an Old Testament prophet had risen again and was preaching, and the news of it spread over the entire Roman world. And a lot of people knew that there was a Hebrew prophet calling people once again to repent of their sins, but not all of those people who heard the message of John had yet learned about Jesus. So Paul said, what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they said. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe on the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They invited Jesus into the center of their hearts, and they were converted. They were saved. They were born again. Something happened to them. And that's where you have to begin with the discipling process. You have to get someone's heart centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, this is the work of God, and the Holy Spirit works within them to do this, but very often He will use us as the human instruments to help lead people to put Christ in the center of their lives. Now, when this happened to me, I want to show you the three phases that we go through. There was somebody in the dormitory when I gave my life to the Lord, and they drew out this little chart for me. I think it's originally based on a very similar set of charts that Campus Crusade for Christ or crew developed. But this is the way that I'm putting it. So look at the first chart. This is the way a lot of people in the world are. The circle represents their life. So the shovel represents their job or their work or their employment. There's entertainment there represented by the TV. Many of them are into sports. They're into education. Maybe they have a boat or they're into hobbies, one hobby or another. They have a house. They home. They have a family. They have friends. All of these things are going on in their lives. They have a very busy life, a very full life, but Christ is not in their life. He's on the outside of their life. This is the non-Christian. This is the way very much of the world is. But here's the next diagram. There are a lot of people, and they have all of those things going on in their life, but Christ is in their life too. He is included as all of the various elements meld together in their hearts. There is Christ. These are people that I would call nominal Christians, and this is the way that I was for the first 19 years of my life, I believe. Because, honestly, I don't know how to explain this, Uh, But I do not remember a time when I was not trusting the Lord Jesus as my Savior. I grew up in a very strong Christian home and church and atmosphere. And I don't know when the moment came when I asked Christ to come into my life. I remember a moment when I said, Lord, if I'm not a Christian, I want to be a Christian now. But I really don't remember a time when I initially asked the Lord to be my Savior. I just grew up in an atmosphere where it was natural to trust Christ. And I'm very grateful for that. I mean, that's a tremendous blessing. But I think that as I went along, especially in my teenage years, this represented my life. So I had a lot of things going on. And Christ was in my life but he wasn't aligned correctly in my heart. 
and something was wrong, and I got to be a freshman in college, and it began to bother me, and I was under conviction, and I knew something was wrong, and I transferred to the college, Columbia International University, where my roommate on the first night in the dormitory, he challenged me to change that alignment to this one. Look at this third one. Here you have Christ in the center of your life, and everything else revolves around Him. Christ has got to be Lord of our lives if our life is to function correctly. We're not calibrated correctly if Christ is in our life, but He's not in the center of our life. And so, based upon that conversation and that challenge on September the 2nd of 1971, I knelt down, and as thoroughly as I knew how, I yielded my life to the Lord Jesus, and I said, Lord, I want you to be Lord of every part of my life. Every section has got a center around you, the way the spokes of a wheel around an axle, and I put Christ as well as I knew how in the middle of my life through full surrender. And that became to me the most significant spiritual decision of my life. It's as though it happened to me only yesterday. So when you disciple someone, you have to do what Paul did here with the Ephesians or what my roommate did with me, and you take them wherever they are to the next step, and you help them make those spiritual decisions of the heart, which results in Jesus being in the very center of their lives as Lord of all. So that's the first step, the heart. This is what we see when Paul arrived in the city of Ephesus. But it didn't stop there. Look at chapter 19. And verse number uh, 8. So it says that Paul entered the synagogue and he spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God, but some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe him publicly, maligned the way. Some people wanted to keep Christ outside of the circle of their life. So Paul left them and he took who? The disciples with him. And what did he do? He had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years. This is the second aspect of mentoring or discipling someone. You have to get them into the lecture hall of Tyrannus. You have to teach them it's a matter of what? The head. You begin with the heart and get that heart right with Christ in the very center, and then you have to fill their head full of biblical truth. And this is what happened to me. This is exactly my testimony, because when I gave my life to the Lord on that night in September of 1971, my roommate had challenged me. He led me to do it, but it was the guy across the hall who said, now, you know what you need? You need to be taught We've got to get you through some discipleship material. And he pulled out these seven books. I'll never forget them. I still have them. And I keep going back to them. But it was the Navigator's Design for Discipleship series. And it's just simply seven books of questions and answers. And he said, now you start with this book one and read the question and look up the verse and you fill it out. And then once a week we'll get together and I will lead you through these books. And I said, all right. And so I spent the week looking up those verses and putting it all down. And then I went across the hall to his room, and we sat down to have our lesson. And it was as though I was discovering the Bible all over again. I mean, I had grown up in church Sunday school, but I had never really, I mean, it was like a revelation to me. And he said, now, who is Jesus Christ? And I tried to explain it and didn't do a very good job. But he said, now, look at this. Christ is completely human. He is a human being. He was born, and he lived, and he died like anyone. Christ is God. He is absolutely, completely God. He has two natures rolled into one person. He began telling me these things, and it's as though I began to learn and grow. And we went through all seven books. I found out later that he had been discipled through that same material by Billy and Ruth Graham. And he was simply passing that on to me across the dormitory hall. And then I also happened to be in classes at Columbia International University. So at the same time, I was taking progress of doctrine and Old Testament survey and New Testament survey and theology and, and all of these classes. And for three years, it was as though, where was I? In the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And I was learning. And if you don't 
help people to grow in their biblical knowledge and take them through some kind of systematic procedure where they can learn what the Bible says canonically. And when they can learn what the Bible says theologically, then you can't disciple them because Paul was interested here in pumping these people full of biblical knowledge. And I wish that I could, could have, uh, and I bet you do too, been there listening to his lectures. What do you think he taught them? his disciples for three years in the hall of Tyrannus. I think that he taught them the contents that would later become the book of Romans, that would later become the book of First and Second Corinthians, at least portions of it. I think that he taught them what would later he would say to the Thessalonians and, and the great material that became his epistles. He perhaps developed it as lectures there, and he taught them, and he taught them, and he taught them, and he taught them. He had a teaching ministry there, and then he was driven out of town, and you know what happened? As soon as he could, he stopped and he wrote them a letter, the book of Ephesians, and he taught them some more. Look at Ephesians with me, chapter 1. Now, when you study Ephesians, this little book that Paul wrote back to the church at Ephesus, it has six chapters, right? Did you know that? Six chapters in Ephesians, and it divides right in the middle, and the first three chapters, chapters 1, 2, and 3, what are they? They are theology. It is teaching. It is rich truths, some of the richest truths of all of the Word of God. So, you begin reading, and it says, Paul to the Ephesians, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And then he goes on and begins to amplify for us and to exposit for us these great blessings. And he goes on and he talks about the nature of the church and how the church is put together. And he talks about the wonder of the fact that there was an age of grace that the Old Testament prophets didn't understand, but it's been revealed now. And he goes on and on and he gives deep teaching to these disciples because if a church does not have a sustained, systematic program of instruction, it cannot make disciples. You've got to teach people the inspiration and the authority of Scripture. You've got to teach people the Trinity, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. You've got to teach people what the Gospels say, what the Epistles say. You've got to help them understand the book of Romans. You've got to help them understand what the Bible teaches about coming day. So there has got to be systematic instruction taking place in a church. And I think we do it here at this church, but I think there are a lot of evangelical churches across America and in their sermons, they get exhortation. We need exhortation. In the small groups, they get relationships. We get relationships. But there is a critical missing layer there of systematic teaching and training and instruction that is absolutely necessary if you're going to make disciples. So Paul here dealt with their hearts, got them right with the Lord, dealt with their heads, pump them full of biblical truth. But then we come to the last half of Ephesians, chapters 4, 5, and 6. What is this about? This isn't theology. This isn't doctrine. Look at chapter 4. As a prisoner for the Lord then, therefore, because of what I've been saying, I urge you to walk worthy, to live worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble. Be gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. What is this? This isn't theology. Look at verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood. Stop telling lies. And speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, and don't give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands so that they will have something to share with those in need. And how do you talk? Well, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. And look over in verse 8, for you were once darkness chapter 5 and verse 8. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk or live as children of light. Verse 15, be very careful then how you live, 
Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Don't be foolish. Understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk on wine. That leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. What is all of this? He is now teaching them to develop the habits of holiness that characterize disciples. So you deal with their hearts and say, Christ needs to be in the center of your life. Look, he's outside of your life. Look, he's in your life, but he's not in the center of your life. He needs to be in the center of your life. And once a person does that, then their minds need to be filled with as much systematic truth and training as you can get in. You have to teach them the precious truths of this book. And as that happens, then their habits begin to change, the way they walk, the way they talk. And very often when you're discipling someone or mentoring them, maybe, they're, maybe their hearts are fully devoted to the Lord. That's already taken place. Maybe they've got a lot of Bible knowledge, but they're having trouble with some addiction. They're having trouble with some pornographic areas. They're having trouble maybe with, with the way that they talk. They're having trouble with the way they're managing their money. So they need to develop the habits of holiness that characterize Christians. So after Paul had devoted three chapters, I mean three years in person, and then three chapters to theology, then he dealt with them about their habits. You just can't go to chapter 5 and talk about habits without the background of biblical information you need. You've got to have a foundation upon which to build those habits, and the foundation is theological. The foundation is educational. The foundation is biblical. And of all of the uh, habits that we need to develop, the most important one is in chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. Look at this. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions. So one of the things that I was taught when I was beginning to be a disciple like this is that I need time every day with the sword of the Spirit and with prayer. I need time with the Lord because discipleship is a living thing. I mean, other people in the world are disciples of someone who is dead. But Christians, Jesus followers, we are followers and disciples of someone who has risen from the dead. We've already sang about that this morning, and he is living, so we have a really living relationship with him, which means we need to converse with him every day. We need this appointment with him every day when he speaks to us in the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, and we speak to him in prayer in the Holy Spirit, and so you have this time every day. And very often when I'm taking a young person, maybe an intern that goes with me on a trip or something, and their hearts are fully committed to the Lord, and they, they've been in Bible college, or they have a lot of information, but they need to develop some real habits of consistency in their Christian life, we talk about how do you have a quiet time? How do you have time every day? How do you journal a little bit and get into the Bible consistently? And how do you pray so that you have this time period every single 24 hours which allows you a personal appointment with God? These are the habits of discipleship that are so very, very important. But it doesn't stop with that. There is still one final step in this paradigm of discipleship that begins with the heart and goes to the head and lives out through the habits. And it's in the final word that God spoke to the Ephesian church, which is found in Revelation chapter 2. So go over to the last book of the Bible with me. This is the final message to this church in Ephesus. And in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your, look at this, what are they doing? Your deeds. And look at this, your hard work. Notice that phrase, your hard work and your perseverance. So after they had received Christ in their hearts, and had filled their mind with all of the teaching that Paul gave them from the lecture hall of Tyrannius. And after they had read Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, and they were theologically strong, and they had developed the habits that are described in Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, what did that result in? Well, boy, that resulted in the fact we are on fire now, and God has given us something to do, and we are going to be engaged in that hard work. 
We're just going out in the strength of all of this, and we are working hard. And a disciple is someone who not only gives his or her heart to the Lord and fills their mind with the Scripture and develops those habits of holiness that reflect Christ, but it's someone who then plunges right into whatever it is God has called you to do in the fulfilling of the Great Commission to make more disciples. Now, the problem here with the Ephesians is down in verse number 4. Yet I hold this against you. You have lost or forsaken the love you had at first. How did that happen? Well, they made one little mistake in their example and their paradigm and their pattern of discipleship. They saw it linear. So, look at this chart. They started with the heart. They filled their head with the Word of God. They developed Christian habits. They got into the hard work of whatever ministry God had given them. But look how far away the word work is from the word heart. But now look at this chart. If you look at discipleship not as being linear, but being cyclical, then you develop your heart and let Christ stay in the center of your heart all the time, and you fill your head constantly with Scripture. It's not a, something that is ever over with or finished in our lives. It's an ongoing process. We develop these habits always growing in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that leads to hard work. But as we work hard, we keep our hearts centered on Christ. We keep growing, and so discipling is not linear. There is a cycle of discipleship that should always be going on inside of us, and when it is, it's going to be spreading to other people. Now, when you get a chance to mentor or disciple somebody, the first thing you have to do is to say, where are they in this continuum? So I had a young man some years ago, and he came to me, and Christ was in his life, but not at the center of his life. So we talked about that, and I showed him those charts and everything, and he made a surrender of his life to the Lord Jesus Christ that was just life-changing, and we pumped him full of Scripture, and I taught him everything I knew. And then I saw his habits begin to change and to mature, and he went into the hard work of serving Christ. He's been doing it ever since. But then some time ago, I took an intern with me, and as we talked, I realized his heart is already, he is sold out to Christ. Jesus is in the center of his life. But he doesn't really know what it means to be filled with the Spirit. He doesn't really know how the Bible is put together. He doesn't understand the authority of Scripture. So I just started at that point and said, you know, there are some things I would love to teach you. But then I had another fellow, and his heart was completely given over to the Lord, and he had been in college and taken correspondence courses, and he knew about as much of the Bible as I did, but he had some problem areas in his life, some habits that weren't working well, and he wasn't consistent with his quiet time. So we just started at that point. And now I'm at the level or at the place in my life where I have a wonderful opportunity occasionally of mentoring maybe a young pastor somewhere. I've got a handful of them. And they are sold out for the Lord. And their heads are full of more knowledge about God than I have in my head. And their habits are so good. They just need a little mentoring help with their profession. They need someone to coach them a little bit with their sermons or with their church administration or whatever it is. And so, I just step in at that point. What I'm saying is that everyone you meet is somewhere in this process we've talked about today, and when you disciple someone or you mentor them, you just figure out where that is and help them go to the next stage. And it's really as simple as that, from the heart to the head to the habits to the hard work and a constant cycle of being and making disciples. This is the great commission of discipleship. And all of us have an opportunity with someone to influence some, somewhere. We have an opportunity to step into someone's life and help them take the stage or the step to the next level. And that really is what making disciples is all about. Lord, who are you going to bring into my life this week? What children, what young people, what friend, what neighbor... What person somewhere in some 
area of life that crosses paths with me? How can I help them just take a step to the next level in their spiritual progress? We all have an opportunity in some way of doing that, and that is mentoring. That is discipling. And that keeps the chain reaction going. So, my dear friends, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard me say among many witnesses, the same and trust thou to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. And we will keep discipling this world right up until Jesus comes again. Will you bow your heads with me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, thank You for laying out for us through the model of this church in Ephesus a simple plan of discipleship that is so relevant that it works for us wherever we are right now. And I pray that You would help us to be disciple-making people so that we can become a disciple-making church. And Father, every one of us here needs to take a forward step so show us what those are, help us to take them, and may we walk with you in an endless growing cycle of maturity. And we ask this, Father, in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Will you stand with me, please, as we sing together?